Welcome to Chicks Who Fly, a podcast dedicated to women pilots and women in aviation. My name is Inaya and I am your host. I am a vocalist, a producer, a pilot, and an advanced ground instructor. I have decided to stay active in the aviation community by doing this podcast, among other things. I plan to interview and feature women pilots and women in aviation and share their aviation love stories with you, as well as the ups and downs that they decide to share. In this fourth episode of Season 2 of Chicks Who Fly, I get to have conversation with Part 135 corporate pilot flying a PC-12 in the Caribbean, born and raised in Rio, Brazil, Debbie Nascimento. Debbie is a first-generation aviator who became a flight attendant at 20. While working in the airline, she used to go into the cockpit and ask the pilots questions about what they were doing, how to fly the airplane, and how to go about getting her certificates and ratings. She decided to take out a loan so that she could do her training quickly. Debbie did her entire training, Part 161, in the insanely busy airspace of New York City while working full-time as a flight attendant. And she ended up getting all her certificates and ratings in an astonishing one year and three month period. Private, instrument, commercial, commercial multi-engine add-on, seaplane, CFI, CFII, advanced ground instructor, tailwheel endorsement, and then went on to get her high performance and high altitude. Debbie is also one of the only two to 300 pilots in the world who are qualified to fly into the island of St. Barts. During her training, one of the things she struggled with was a fear of stalls and feeling uncomfortable with steep turns, but she found her instrument reading her easiest and most fun, which is the one that most people call their most difficult and boring. We talk about the mental shift she made that had her see her instrument reading from that perspective, and much, much more. At the time of this interview, Debbie was getting ready to go to her first assigned base with her Part 135 company in San Juan, Puerto Rico. If you are enjoying this podcast, please go ahead and give us a like, a follow, and a nice review on whatever platform you are using to listen to this podcast. If you would also like to support this show and help us keep improving and growing and bringing better and better quality content to you, there is an opportunity to support this show by clicking on the listener support in the Anchor app. It will be a link in the show notes. Also, feel free to visit us and connect with us on our website, chickswhofly.com, and you can reach us by email at chickswhoflyofficial at gmail.com. So without further ado, here is the conversation that I got to have with Debbie Nascimento. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> Welcome. Super excited to have you on. Tell us who you are, what your ratings are, and what your current relationship to aviation is. So I'm Debbie Nascimento. I'm 24. I'm born and raised in Rio in Brazil. And I am this first generation aviator in my family. However, I've always kind of loved it, always kind of looked up to the sky. I knew that that was something I was going to do someday, but just like most of us, when we get started, we have kind of no idea the path to go or what route to take. So I became a flight attendant in 2017 when I was 20 years old. From then on, I met a lot of cool people. They kind of pushed me in the right direction. Um, and while I was still a flight attendant, I began flight training. Um, today, I'm a CFII with and obviously also a commercial pilot with a seaplane rating, two endorsement, high performance, high altitude, and I fly PC-12. At a company called Trade and Aviation, super cool, 135 operator, flies charters as well as uh, shuttles. And I am having a lot of fun up here in New York, and as of next week, Puerto Rico. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. You are a first-generation aviator, and you were drawn to become a flight attendant. And then how did it become apparent to you that it was a possibility for you to pursue becoming a pilot at all and then decide to actually pursue it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, 
truth be told, I wanted to become a pilot from the get-go. I just didn't really know how to race. So I figured uh, I should get this in the door somehow. So step one was just submitting an application to an aviation-related job. And I chose to be a flight attendant. I know a lot of people who did the same thing, but they just chose to become gate agents or ramp agents or something else related in the field. So once I started working, I just began to ask questions. Like, it was weird because there was a bit of a divide between flight attendants and pilots, I noticed, in the airlines. They usually don't mingle much, contrary to popular belief. They really don't. So I was that mingler. <laughs> I was the one that was going to cockpit and be like, hey, so what does this button do? What are you doing right now? What's that? Am I annoying yet? You know. <laughs> so, um, most of them will be really nice to answer all my questions. And then, like, I began to ask the practical questions. How did you get started? How is this a degree? Is it something to go to college for? Do you need to go to college for it? Like, what's the difference between Part 62 and training 141? So I'm going to do this. Like, how? which one should I pursue? And so eventually, like, I was based in JFK, living in New York City, and I decided to just Google flight schools in Long Island, New York. And a couple popped up, and I went to go check them out myself. From then on, it was just a question of uh, finances, to which, you know, most of us, not all of us, kind of have to deal with, too. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was just, I took out student loans, and I was really fortunate to have my dad as a co-signer for me. And as much as I like the pay-as-you-go method, I know that I would not have been able to get as far as I did, as fast as I did, without my student loan. So if that's a possibility for people and they're trying to get them fast, I do encourage it because we're going to make it back. It's like an investment in ourselves. Totally. And and so did you end up going Part 61? I did. I did my entire training Part 61 while working full-time as a flight attendant. It was brutal. I did not have a life, but I finished my private instrument, commercial, commercial multi-add-on, CFI, CFII, ground instructor, instrument ground instructor, seaplane and tail endorsement in about a year and three months. That is absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> it was that, crazy. <laughs> well, working. Holy poo. I just took my uh, Fundamentals of Instruction written today. <laughs> nice. How did it go? It, I got a 92. Congratulations. Yeah, the FOI is, is so silly. It's, it's such it a is. funny test. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I I was mad I didn't get 100. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> oh, my God. It's totally okay. Those, yeah, it's a really funny test. Funny studying but for the FOI, too. <laughs> I, you know, I want to get my AGI so that I can start looking mm -hmm. for work, maybe independent student. I'm going to ask you for tips about that later because I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so back to you. So you're you're going part 61. You cram it all in. What what was training like for you? What was your first lesson like and, and your early progress? My first lesson, I remember exactly when it was. It was January 1st, 2019. It was freezing cold um, in Long Island, New York, and I saw a little diamond katana that, of course, wouldn't start in the cold. So <laughs> my very first lesson was me waiting for the plane to preheat because we had to go, you know, get the heater for it. And I'm just hanging out there and thinking, huh, this will be an interesting journey if this is how it's going to go every day. <laughs> But it was amazing from the second we got in there. And New York, as uh, everyone knows, is, is pretty much like one of the busiest airspaces in the world. So training out of uh, Farmingdale called Republic Airport, Kilo, Foxtrot, Romeo Golf, KFRG. So look it up, guys. Um, it's an insanely busy class delta. It's right underneath JFK's Bravo, and we're talking nonstop. So if you don't communicate, if you don't have, like, good communication skills with APC, it's just not going to happen. It's kind of a trial-by-fire airport. So I remember being really, really overwhelmed in the start, really overwhelmed. But you have to kind of push through it, listen to live ATC on your time off, familiarize yourself with phraseology. And I think that the most important – I don't uh, – maybe not important, but – I think that I developed my communication skills really, really, really well because of that whole trial by fire early stage. 
Oh, I bet. But I learned to drive in Puerto Rico, and now I can drive almost <laughs> anywhere without a problem. Anywhere, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I also, when I started uh, flying, I was flying in Santa Monica, which is under the Bravo Air Space for LAX. So, mm-hmm. so it was also like that. But then I also had a lot of a lot of other airports that I flew out of because my training, unlike yours, took forever in a million different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, so all you've seen it all. (laughs) It was a lot more slow going, but I do think it made me, you know, a better pilot early on to have experience in so many different airports and types of airspace, et cetera. Like in Palm Springs, we even flew, there was a Chursa, so... Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So let me ask you the actual training. Like, you start doing stalls, you start doing, you know, slow flight and all the normal kinds of stuff. Did did the flying come easy? Was there something that was particularly challenging or particularly easy? (laughs) Yeah, for me, I was already semi-comfortable in the air, given that I was a flight attendant, but, you know, being behind the controls was a it was a whole other experience. So I have to say that for me, communications came really easy. I didn't have mic fright. That's it. And I know that a lot of um, my students later on, when I did become a CFI, they struggle with that. Some people have mic fright, others don't. And that's okay. Because I used to make, you know, PAs to my customers all the time, I, I didn't have mic fright. So that helped me a lot in communicating with APC. I was afraid to make mistakes. You know, I make them all the time. They correct me. I'll say it correctly, and then we'll move on. They're professional, you know, and expect you to be professional as well. Landing was relatively easy. I was I was fortunate to um, be one of those twenty hour solo students. However, maneuvers for me were a little more challenging. I for some reason had a weird thing with falls at first. I was so so scared of that of of spinning that I would recover before even the first indication. I would never take it to a full stall. That was something that I had to overcome before my check ride. So it was just when there were steep turns, I felt really unstable. I don't know why. I think because I had never experienced that in flying before. I was used to taking off and landing and then cruising. And sometimes there would be a little turbulence, but then getting on the ground safely because no pilot at my airline was, was doing steep turns with the Airbus. So I uh, <laughs> wasn't really used to that. And now suddenly it's me and I'm having to put the airplane in that attitude. And that was uncomfortable. So it's one of those things that is more mental than anything. You have to tell yourself that the plane's under control and you're in control. And that's what I began telling my students later on. Even in a spin, plane is still under control. You know, it's not like it's going to spiral out of control and then you don't know what to do. Like, the plane's controllable at all times. So once we're able to get through that little jitters in your tummy from pulling a few extra Gs than what we're used to, we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> So you just got over it with practice? Practice, experience, and positive self-talk. The plane is not going to crash. The plane is not going to fall down. You know, you're in control, and, and you're the pilot, and, and relax. Because just because you're putting in a 45-degree bank doesn't mean that you're suddenly going to be inverted. You know, <laughs> sometimes it might feel that way. But, yeah, exactly, just practice and affirmation. Cool. And after you got your private, well, first of all, was your check ride easy, traumatic? What was your check ride like? <laughs> um, I've been fortunate to not have a failure so far on my record from private to my 135 check ride. But if I were to say that it, the most difficult check ride I've ever had was my private, it really was. And I don't know if it was just because it, it was difficult and hindsight maybe it wasn't. But I was just so nervous, and it was so new because I didn't know what to expect. I had never had a check ride before. So right. it was it was very fair. It was very forgiving, you know, because there's no such thing as a perfect check ride. In reality, like, an examiner can fail us for, for anything, for not using enough rudder, which is something really silly. But he was very fair. He looked at the overall big picture, and I did a good job overall. But I would not say it was easy. What I would say is that every check ride gets a little bit easier because you learn how to deal with your own nerves and um, how to prepare a little better. Understood. My, my chakra, I don't know, I think I suffer from imposter syndrome because <laughs> I, I, I feel like 
the reason I ever get anything is because they were easy on me. I don't really deserve it. And I know in my head it's not true, but that's the conversation that happens in my head. I know. And we were always telling ourselves, really? Like, that was good enough? But but it really was because they're not trying to release unsafe pilots out in the world. So if, if we pass, it's because we earned it, which is good. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people told me I was ready before I ever felt like I was ready. That's always but, how it's going to go, especially with Solo, too. Yes. Well, with Solo, my, I had over 70 hours. As you know, I was backseating in a lesson that you had with a student right before my know, solo. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my experience when I did the Solo was that I didn't even – Notice that Fernando wasn't in the plane because I was just so used to doing pattern work. I was just focused on what I was doing, you know? Yes, exactly. That's always how it's going to go. Well, I, I'm glad that, that I passed, but of course now there's a million other things to keep working on to get somewhere. How, what was your instrument training like? That's what I started working on. And usually people say that the instrument or their CFI check ride was the hardest. And, that wasn't your experience. So what was no. instrument like? I, I, it's very personal. I um, remember that I had a, I wouldn't say a classmate because 61, you're kind of doing um, it on your own. But there was another student at my flight school that we started around the same time. We were time building partners. And we had completely opposite experiences. He thought that his private was insanely easy. Um, he nailed it. Very cake. But he had such a tough time with his instrument training. And I thought that the instrument training, as well as my CFII, was the easiest and the most fun. And it just has to do with the way that our brains are wired. And that's perfectly okay. I um, loved kind of getting to see the operations from a perspective of something that I'm going to be doing in the future, which is, you know, flying for an airline, which is my um, ultimate goal, or even flying for the charter airline that I fly for right now, in which we use instrument flying literally every single day, I wanted to be more immersed. Yeah, immersed is the proper way to say. I'll be, I wanted to be more immersed in that world instead of just doing steep turns and stalls all day, which I really even wasn't a fan of. <laughs> so it's just a matter also of personal preference when it comes to flying. I, uh, I have had a few students in my CFI days that uh, – had a really tough time with their instrument training, but then turned out to be VFR robotics pilots. And stalls never bothered them. <laughs> That's so funny. I just got checked out in a 172 here in Titusville, and the mm-hmm. owner of the school is an aerobatic pilot, and he teaches aerobatics. That and is really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, just... I'm really tempted to take a lesson or two before we leave here. <laughs> I think you should. I mean, I, I did a little bit of aerobatics myself on the yak with uh, one of my former students from uh, from Tamiami, and it was a lot of fun, but it's definitely not my cup of tea. I would rather fly three hours in IMC <laughs> any day before I go inverted. <laughs> really? I've, I've only done the instrument ground school. I haven't – well, I did one uh, approach uh, during a checkout because the – the CFI that checked me out was really cool. She was like, well, let, you know, she knew I was working on my instrument ground school, and she let me shoot an approach. And it was definitely a very high workload, especially in Cross Charlie airspace in Daytona. But, um, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I need a little more experience with that before I know how I feel about it. <laughs> and you will. I had a, I saw the captain the other day that he told me, Debbie, like, Instrument flying is supposed to be boring. If you're stressed out about it, it's because there's something wrong with the way you're handling it. And if, and I realize that he's right. Like, eventually we come to a point in which an instrument does become boring because it's systematic. It's very systematic. Um, everything follows an order. Everything has, a, everything has a method. So once you learn what you have to do, when you have to do it, what buttons you have to push, and how to interpret um instrument plates, approaches, starts, SIDs, GPs, et cetera. It just becomes another task. So eventually you get to the point in which you're shooting an approach, you're like, okay, 
cool. I know what's going on. And then it's going to be boring. And then that's when you've mastered it. <laughs> well, I look forward to that day. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to say when I started flying, I can't wait until the day where I'm as comfortable in the airplane as I am jumping in my car in Los Angeles, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and then once that day happens, you're going to move on to a bigger airplane, and you're going to be uncomfortable all over again. <laughs> yeah, you just repeat, rinse and repeat. <laughs> rinse and repeat. <laughs> so I don't know if I ever told you, but it is my dream to at least get my commercial seaplane and perhaps even do CFI seaplane. So you tell me about your seaplane training, because you said you, you're, you have that rating, right? Yes. So um, where I did mine is uh, I flew Sea Rays, which is an amphibious tail wheel, and I did that in Lakeland, Florida, at this place called Flying Fish. And I did my check ride at Jack Brown. Jack Brown says Piper Cubs and Floats. Both are super awesome places to go. Highly recommended, uh, both. And once you are a CFI, after you get your seaplane rating, then you don't need to do an additional CFI check ride for your seaplane. Like you can already teach in a seaplane. As long as of course like you have your um required hours in the particular plane you're gonna be instructing in. So that was a lot of fun. It's it's very well my, how my DP described it, um flying seaplanes is very artistic. <laughs> like you gotta be really creative with it with it because you need to when you're landing in a lake there's no runway. You need to imagine one. So in a way, like the stick and render skills that you need to fly a seaplane are, they need to be very sharp. You need to be very imaginative. And because it's not like you have a paved runway that's going to be steady ground all the time. It might be landing waves. It might be landing in a strictly no wind condition in which the, the, the water is so glassy that you can't even see where it is. So then like there are specific procedures for landing, like there are different landing maneuvers that you do depending on the condition of the water. So it's really interesting. It's, it's really cool. Unfortunately, I never got to instruct in a seaplane. That would definitely be something to consider in the future just for fun. But I eventually want to get my single or my multi-engine C because I have my single engine land, my single engine C, my multi-engine land, and now I want my multi-engine C. And I have no idea how I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be in Puerto Rico. I'm sure you'll figure out a way. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm in a interesting situation, so I just want to keep moving in the right direction. And I also got my commercial drone remote SUAS. Mm -hmm. Cool. The other day, just anything that I can actually use to start working again, because my life doesn't look anything like it did before COVID. So right. I'm trying to make up a whole new life and a new way to move forward. <laughs> Very cool. And I think you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of success doing ground instruction after you get your AGR. Thank you. I, I definitely hope so. I never thought I was interested in teaching anything. Like when I used to do music, mm -hmm. I just felt like teaching people ruined the experience for me. Because <laughs> I, I wasn't enjoying it. But I can relate. Like, well, I've, I've done it for so long, but with aviation, it came to me late in life, and and so I know what it's like to be a complete beginner that doesn't even know how to read the runway signs, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the beauty of being an instructor, that you, you've been in their shoes, so you get to help them out with kind of a smooth transition during that tough initial phase. So that was really, really the most rewarding part for me, I think, about being an instructor. Did you enjoy being a CFI? Ooh, do you want the real answer or the fake answer? No, no, for <laughs> real, because everybody struggles with this stuff. So, yeah, let's be real. Let's be real. Um, teaching is not what I was born to do, for sure. There were a lot of rewarding moments about it. I loved it when I signed off the student for a check ride and they passed it. Like, I was more proud of them. I was I was happier when a student passed a check ride than when I passed my own check ride. It was really <laughs> cool. It was like a proud mom feeling, like, congratulations. No, I, I produced you. I made you who you are, and I'm so happy. 
So that was insanely rewarding. That to me was probably, that was worth all the struggles. But realistically, I've been the most patient woman in the world, I guess. <laughs> so I'm explaining a concept over and over and over and maybe something that it's not the student's fault per se. Maybe, you know, the student has a little bit more difficulty with instrument training than I did. And trying to explain a concept to a student and they just are not grasping as as easily as I did was fr- was frustrating for me, but it's not their fault. And and just in that, you know, like a really, really good instructor will have all the patients in the world, will have a million ways of explaining concepts and to eventually explain it in such a way that the student's going to get it. And... I am happy to say that I had uh, very, very happy students. Um, all my students really enjoyed flying with me. I uh, did not have any issues, but it was wearing me out a lot physically and mentally, and I was just ready to move on to the next step. And my job now is catered more to what I wanted to do with flying in the first place, which is flying point A to point B, IFR, dealing with customers and, and flying with a crew, and definitely happier in my job now. But I wouldn't mind instructing on the side just to keep it fun. Cool. Well, you know what? Our plan is to take our sailboat to Puerto Rico. Like, we want to go through the Caribbean, and we want to spend some time in Puerto Rico. So. No. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, we're going to rent a plane, and we're going to go uh, do some island hopping. You read my freaking mind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, you and I have a date in the air in Puerto Rico sometime. I love it. (laughs) In the near future. So when do you leave for Puerto Rico? I leave July 9th, so in about a week. (laughs) Wow, that's so soon. That's so exciting. I know, and it was kind of thrown at me last minute. I knew I was going to go, but they originally told me I wasn't going to go until October. And then magically, I was like, hey, Debbie, like, we need pilots in the Caribbean, and you volunteers, so bye-bye. I'm like, okay, let's just do it. <laughs> Love Heck it. yeah. So what, I want to know what training was like. Training at uh, my charter airline was, it was more difficult than my initial training and my CFI training combined. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> I used to say that training, that my CFI training was, uh, Everything that I learned throughout my initial training and more crammed in one month. Well, I learned more in my 135 operator training than I did in my initial training and my CFI training combined. I learned more in one week. It was it was insane. It was very fast paced. I was studying about 18 hours a day. I woke up at 5 a.m. every day, studied from 5 to 7, went to class at 8, was in class from 8 to 6 p.m., and then you know, went and had a little break to eat and, and shower and then studied from about 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., went to sleep around 11, woke up at 5 again to go study. So it was worse than in the end. <laughs> well, you know, they want to make sure that they that were living up to the task and that uh, they chose the most capable candidates that they could. For my class, I had a class of five people, including me. We were five people. And there were 2,000 applicants for that class. So wow. when they chose us, they wanted to make sure that they chose those that could live up to the task. And it was, it was tough but rewarding. And at the end of the day, if you're learning about something that you love, it's still going to be hard. <laughs> but it's going to be enjoyable. And I was really fortunate to have amazing classmates. And they became like family. And the, the five of us now like, continue to hang out and help each other out through anything, and it was tough. It was uh, one month of training and about three weeks of ground training and then one week in the simulator, and we went to flight safety for that, for the simulator, and um, that in itself was very intense. It was about six hours per day of simulator training, but it was a lot of fun, and here we are. (laughs) And what, what did you have to do in the simulator? In a simulator, primarily we studied SOPs, which are standard operating procedures, um, because when you fly with a crew, then each individual was assigned a, a specific task. It's not like, oh, you get a frequency change. Anybody can, you know, go ahead and change frequency. Anybody can drop the gear. Anybody can change the flaps. Well, in reality, sure, 
depending on the situation, but we, each crew member has a, has a designated job, whether you're pilot flying or pilot monitoring. So we had to learn call outs, our jobs, the different roles when we're flying and when we're monitoring. And uh, we had to learn the airplane. We had to learn different flows, given the PC-12 is a very complex airplane. Uh, it's a single-engine turboprop, but it's an insanely complex single-engine turboprop. So there was a lot to learn, as well as emergency procedures. There was one day that was just strictly emergencies, in which was six hours of emergency after emergency after emergency after emergency. And then we walked out of there like, how did we survive it? <laughs> you forget that you're in a simulator because you're just so focused on what's going on. Very brain frying. <laughs> yeah, it's good to make emergencies like a normal thing so that if something ever does happen, it's just a normal thing that you deal with. I see some people that are like, oh, avoid emergency. All I do is watch air crash investigation type of <laughs> shows. All my downtime, when I'm not having to learn something, that's what I'm doing. Uh, did you do your AGI before you got your CFI? I did. AGI shortly before I went to CFI Academy. Okay. Well, since I'm working on my AGI now, so how mm -hmm. hard is it? What's covered in it? What was it like? For the test itself, you, you want to use Shep, Shep Air. Shepherd Air is just the guaranteed way to pass any essay you've written ever. <laughs> um, That's how I pass Fundamentals of Instruction, by the way. That's what go. I do. <laughs> yep. Shepherd Air is the best way to go. It's pass the test, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're learning all of the material. So for that, I utilize American Flyers for most of my ground training. And their flight school, uh, they have a competent location, Morristown, Jersey, Arizona, Chewing, Texas, and uh, nationwide. They've been around forever. And I will always recommend American Flyers for a CFI Academy. So I used a lot of their ground material. They have, like, textbooks that they've written themselves that is really, really easy to learn. It's just like the P-Hack, you know, the Pi Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, but in a more user-friendly and easier to understand format. So I use a lot of their stuff as well as the um, free FAA material on the on the website. Do they have their materials, uh, American Flyers, uh, somewhere where you can just access them or purchase them, or you had them because you flew with them? I purchased them when I signed up for, they have like weekend ground courses, like written ground courses. So say for each ground, your private ground, like your private written, your instrument written, your commercial written, they have these um, three-day ground courses that you do and you get the study material with it. So I utilize a lot of that study prep. Okay. But, I mean, you can get the same material for free on the FA website, like just the PHAC or the FARAM, and it's going to be the same exact material. I just like the way that American Flyers kind of word it and explain. Are the questions more technical or I don't even, because I haven't downloaded the, the Shepherd Air only lets you do uh, one test at a time. Right, so yeah. I, I haven't even downloaded the material through, so I don't know what to expect. Is it pretty well, technical? It's pretty technical, yeah. It's actually very, very, very similar to your commercial, if you've done that. No, you haven't done that one yet. Uh, well, it's actually pretty similar to your private one, too. It's very similar to your private written. In fact, I think it's a, they take part of the same questions from, like, the same question bank. It's just making sure it's not going to be much teaching-oriented. That's mostly just your uh, written. But, yeah, I would have to say it's it's you going to be more similar to your private written than you would be to your FOI or your flight instructor. Okay, cool. Well, at least I, I have an idea. What is your favorite flight you've ever taken, whether as a pilot or a passenger? Probably the first time I went in IMC. It was up here. I was a student working on my instrument training. And it was the first time I went into a cloud. And we're climbing out or we're climbing up and we're getting high, you know, well, well, high, 9,000 feet. It's not very high anymore, but at the time it was insanely high, given that I had only been like three or 4,000. So we're about to enter a cloud. It's pretty steady IMC. Like there's a solid layer of broken at like 8,000. So we're, we're climbing up 
And my instructor goes, okay, cool, we're about to enter a cloud. Don't freak out. I'm like, excuse me? What do you mean don't freak out? And she's just like, no, don't freak out. I'm like, okay. And then everything goes blank. Everything is just white all over me, and I have no sense of direction. I'm like, oh, my God. And she's like, I told you not to freak out. (laughs) (laughs) And it was a solid IMC for, like, a whole hour. It was across country. Oh, my God. And initially, like, I was very, like, up and down and back and forth and banking and pitching. And my instruments were a little all over the place. But I, and she's like, stop looking outside. You're looking outside still. You be a far pilot. I'm like, you're right. You're right. This is, this is the IFR world now. Like, this is it. Uh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So then I just looked inside only. Just fix your gaze inside. And I saw it as a video game. So I'll just try to keep it steady. And then when we broke out, I got disoriented because we broke out. And I was like, wait, I can see again. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> so I guess this sounds pretty boring. Like that my in my favorite flight, I couldn't see anything. But to me, that was exciting, not being able to see anything. <laughs> when I was training with Fernando, we were on our way to somewhere for some preparation. And we went into clouds. Of course, he was PIC and he's instrument rated, so no problem. But some of my first IFR training was in actual IFR. And it is pretty trippy when you, like, get into this cloud suddenly. And it is. Wild. It is. The foggles don't do it justice. They really don't. <laughs> And I felt like you, like I kept wanting to look outside, but there was nothing there. And I had the same conversation. I I used to DJ, so I used to spend three, four, five hours staring at my computer screen mixing music. Oh, there you go. (laughs) So I was like, it's just like that. (laughs) It's just like that. It's just like playing a video game or mixing music. (laughs) Except what's coming in through your ears on those headphones is, not anywhere nearly as nice as some good music. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Sometimes it's not fun to be listening to at all. That mess in New York airspace. Right? I've heard the controllers can be pretty intimidating. Did you get disoriented, like, spatially when you entered that cloud? A little bit, yeah. A little bit spatially disoriented. But it was only because I was trying to look outside and trying to find ground or a reference point or a horizon and there was nothing and then once you just look at your instruments and you just have to trust it i think that that's the scariest part for a lot of pilots is trusting your instrument you know like you're having to rely on the machine at this point and it's like it's sometimes it almost feels like you're not in control because you're having to rely on the machine but you are in control and you just use it a lot, utilizing it as a tool so learn to trust the airplane if you've done sort of pre-flight there should be nothing wrong with the plane <laughs> and if there is you should be able to identify it as an instrument pilot like a block speedo tube or static port and just go from there everything is a learning soon cool well i want to get some more like experiences from you like what was your first like solo cross country like was that at all like intimidating was it exciting where'd you go it was fun. I um I crossed over to Long Island Sound, so I left Long Island and Republic Airport, went to Groton Airport, which is in Connecticut, and an eastbound, and then I kind of triangulated the Long Island Sound. So I left Farmingdale to Groton, Groton to Bridgeport, which is just a straight line along the shore, also in Connecticut, and then crossed Long Island Sound back to Farmingdale. So just think of like a triangle. Um, over the Long Island Sound, and it was it was a beautiful day. It was cold. It was freezing cold, and I was in a little diamond katana, taking selfies galore and cruise, of course. And just kind of, I remember being bored. I remember flying and wanting to like chit chat with my instructor, and she wasn't there. And I think I would rather be bored than be too excited right it's it's better to be bored because it means that it's pretty uneventful um so i'll take that feeling any day so i liked being bored it was fun like talking to tower 
and making mistakes and being corrected by them and learning from my mistakes instead of like being told what to say. That was all, that was all really cool. It was definitely being released out in the open in the wild and just kind of having to figure it out. I always find I do better like that too. Like I, I have to get pushed out of the nest kicking and screaming. Yes. Exactly. Oh. That's how we thrive. But once I'm out, I'm like, oh, I'm doing this much better. Uh, one of the last interviews I had, I was talking to my CFI from Santa Fe, and one time we were taking off, and she had another student who was doing a solo cross country at that same time, and he called her on the phone. So, you know, she picked up to make sure he was okay. Mm-hmm. And of course she was keeping an eye on what I was doing, but I felt like I was on my own. And I yeah. it was so much better. I'm like, why? You know, I, I it was very clear to me how I was psyching myself out. I think it's because, like, when we're students, we're also under the the, the pressure to, like, impress our instructors. And sometimes that might lead us to that might cause us to make a few mistakes. I experienced that today, even, like, flying with new captains. I want to, like, impress them and show them that I know how to fly and that I know what I'm doing, that I know my, my SOPs. And sometimes, like, it goes that I want to show them, like, what great stick and rudder skills I have with a PC-12, and then it ends up, like, not being a good landing. And then when I'm more relaxed, not really caring too much, that those are my best landings. So it's also that <laughs> added factor. Yeah, you know what? It's exactly the same for me singing. If I'm just, singing. Hmm. Yeah, like what, when I'm singing in in a room full of people, but I'm not like particularly aware. It's just like a normal night. I'd sing mm-hmm. my butt off, but like <laughs> if there's somebody like really important sitting in the audience or somebody like dear to me that is, you know, for example, never seen me do a live show or something, like I'll be like sometimes self conscious and, and it it interferes with, with the level of performance as that's much as you funny, don't want. Yeah. That's that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's a human thing, I guess. <laughs> so what do you want to do now moving forward? I know this is just a brand new moment for you, like in a new company about to set off to a new location to, you know, basically it's a whole new life. Yeah. What do you look forward to? And do you have your sights set on anything else after that? Yeah. I mean, uh, the long-term goal is to go back to the airlines. And uh, I've always known that ever since I was a flight attendant. I love going. I love the airlines. I love the 121 world. I'll always advocate for it. It's not for everybody, but since I already lived it, I know that it is for me. So I'm loving the 135 world, too, for now. Um, it's definitely something that I wanted to do before I went to a career airline. I wanted to get that hands-on flying experience and kind of broaden my horizons when it comes to flying instead of just, like, going from being a CFI, reaching your ATP men, and then going to an airline and never getting to do anything else. Because 135 flying, like, allows you to be really, really hands-on. Like, we are doing our weight balance. Uh, we're doing our fuel planning. We're doing our weather planning. We pretty much dispatch ourselves. And uh, it's, it's very, very hands-on. We learn a lot. We learn a cool new airplane. PC-12 is super, super fun airplane to fly. And we do Caribbean island hopping. And that's really, really unique experience. We fly... Into St. Bart's, which at all times, there are only like not even like two or three hundred people in the world who are um, qualified to fly into St. Bart's. You need special training to fly to St. Bart's. So, like, it's kind of cool to think like you are going to be like among two or three hundred pilots in the world that can fly into that little island. So, like, that's the unique flying that I'm enjoying doing for now. But eventually, um, when I go back to the airlines, that's kind of where I want to settle down. Nice. Well, that's pretty badass. I mean, there's a lot of aviation in Brazil. Would you ever be interested in in going, you know, to Brazil to to pursue any aviation goals? Yeah, that's a good question. It kind of crossed my head a little bit to convert my my FAA search to ANAC. 
which is like our FA over there. But I wouldn't want to do any commercial flying down there, no. Um, the U.S. just has a better quality of life for um, and better pay for, for pilots altogether. But I would love to do gen, um, general aviation flying down there, and it's definitely in the works. Um, when I go back, I plan on getting checked out at a local um, community airport in Rio and uh, just flying down there for the first time. And talking to tower in Portuguese is going to be weird. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to that, just new challenges. Yeah, I've, I've wondered about that because, you know, I, I know there is a lot of aviation in Brazil. Is, is there a pretty active general aviation community as well? How does it compare to the U.S.? It does not compare to the U.S. The U.S. is really unique in its um, Genève world. Like, no other country in the world compares to the U.S. when it comes to general aviation. So we really are in the best, best place we could be for it. <laughs> We're very blessed. We are. I see a lot of people from a lot of different countries all over the world coming here to study and train because it's more accessible. As much as sometimes the cost of flight training here makes me go, oof. <laughs> it's nothing compared to what a lot of my friends have had to pay learning in other countries. Yeah, it's, it's a whole other experience. Fully worth it to be here for it. Cool. Is there any really big goal, dream that you have in aviation that you haven't shared? Well, I'm just going to bring another emphasis to it. Yeah, I've, I've shared with you that I want to get my um, multi-engine C, which is just unique. I, I want to keep adding ratings and, and, and privileges and, and certificates to the resume for no particular reason at all, just because it's fun. I want to learn how to fly a hot air balloon. <laughs> And it seems really silly, but it would be really cool for me to fly a balloon. Those and are cool. Those are cool, right? So just yeah. – but then again, like the kind of fun flying that we'll get to do will just be in my later years when, when I'm making enough to be able to just settle down, own an airplane. And I definitely plan on being – a lot more active in the general aviation world as I currently am now, and that's just purely financial. But um, when that changes in the future, yeah, I'm gonna I want to own a little um, it's called an AirCam, which is an experimental. It's a really cool little twin VFR airplane that uh, you can add floats to it, and then maybe that'll be my multi-engine C airplane and uh, keep it in my backyard someday and fly hot air balloons for fun. <laughs> okay, that sounds pretty cool. It sounds similar to some of my bucket list items. I'm into the Icon A5, but that one's pretty expensive. Oh, but that's a pretty one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's good for fun flying for sure. I think it's the best airplane that I know for just fun flying. Most likely. That's a really cool fun flying airplane. There are a lot of those out there. The Air Cam, the Sea Ray, Piper Cub, or even a Stearman. The Stearman would be a fun flying airplane, too. That's true. But what I like about the Icon A5 is also that it's so compact and you can fold the wings and just put it on a trailer or something like that. Yeah, I just carry around wherever you go. <laughs> yeah, nice. kind of like the airplane version of the Sony Walkman in the 80s. <laughs> All right, so I guess the last question is, do you have any advice that you want to leave anyone who aspires to a career in aviation or to start their aviation training? Well, for those that want to make aviation a career, my biggest advice is network from early on. I was really fortunate to get hired by this company in the middle of COVID, and that was only because I had met connections from when I was even still a flight attendant. And I kept in touch with those connections, and they eventually wrote me recommendation letters that got me to where I am. So networking for um, those that want to make it a career, do it, get involved in those groups, women in aviation, 99s, whatever, the Latino Pilot Association, whatever applies to you or even doesn't apply to you, just go to those conferences and, and build that, start building that web because aviation is really tiny and everybody knows each other and you never know what's going to pop up in your life someday that's going to be a, a defining, defining factor in your career. For those that um, are just kind of learning how to fly, 
I just want to do it for fun is have fun with it and don't stress out and don't feel like you need to do everything super duper fast. We have all the time in the world. Don't take out student loans if you don't have to, but if you want to go fast and build a career, there's nothing wrong with it. And um, just know that it's an investment in yourself. That's something I have to keep telling myself all the time. Student loans just kind of help get me to where I am and I don't regret them. And it's just an investment in your, in your future. Yes, that's excellent advice. And I don't think anyone has approached the advice. When I've asked them for advice, they haven't approached it like that before. So I like it. I like the unique perspective. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing your experience and your insights with us. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. And that concludes this episode of Chicks Who Fly. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. I hope that you have enjoyed these conversations as much as I enjoy creating them. Thank you for sharing your aviation love story with us. You can reach us at chickswhoflyofficial at gmail.com or visit our website chickswhofly.com. Also, if you'd like to be a more intimate part of the creation of this podcast, please check out our Patreon, Chicks Who Fly, where you can support us for as little as $3 per creation. Thank you again so much for your time. We hope to see you next time here on Chicks Who Fly.